Well, welcome to this second Media Lunch Club podcast, and it's an absolute pleasure to welcome Colin Vaines, whose resume is astonishing. He is a film and TV producer uh, behind such titles as Film Stars Don't Die in Liverpool, Gangs of New York, Coriolanus, The Young Victoria, and The Rum Diary. Uh, Colin, you're a busy man. Um, can I ask how you feel your role as producer has evolved over the years? Well, I, I started um, I started in the development side of the business. I was a journalist originally, and I was asked to run the National Film Development Fund, as it then was back in the day when National Film Finance Corporation existed. And uh, I really sort of learnt on the job in, in a way that it was partly an administrative thing, but it was also a creative thing as well. And I was very fortunate in that I had a panel of consultants I could work with and I could choose those people. So I basically chose the people I'd got to know really well in the film industry. So I had this amazing group of people like Alan Parker and John Borman and Richard Lester, uh, Alan Plater, incredible people, um, Alan Scott, uh, that, that would cut in. So, so in a sense, I learned on the job and I learned, I, I, I kind of had a very strong opinions. I was a massive film fanatic and film buff from the time I was a little boy. Uh, and had a sort of encyclopedic knowledge of, of movies and so on. And so therefore, I suppose, instinctively, one picks up a lot about uh, development, structure, all those kind of things. Um, and then that career sort of continued from there and, uh, you know, working for companies like Columbia Pictures and then working for David Putnam at Enigma and so on. And it was David who gave me the opportunity to produce for the first time that I there was a, uh, I developed a, a, a TV program for him, which was about T. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, after uh, Arabia, and it was set during the Paris Peace Conference um, of 1919. In fact, it's remarkably a uh, relevant story to today, because it's very much about the mess of the Middle East and uh, everything that sort of happened there subsequently, um, in terms of colonial interference, I mean. Anyway, uh, it, that, that was something which we were doing with Anglia Television, as it then existed, and uh, it was actually Brenda Reed at Anglia who said, well, you've done so much work on this in development and so on, why don't you come on board as one of the producers? And uh, Putnam was an exec producer with Brenda, and uh, my other colleague that I was working with at Enigma, Alberto Pasolini, who went on to do great things like The Full Monty, that he was the other young guy there and we produced it together and we kind of again discovered things as we went along but I think it's a pretty good little film it was the film you know we discovered Ray Fiennes we got him out the Royal Shakespeare Company to do it uh, it was directed by Chris Manall who'd just done Prime Suspect on TV and uh, much to our amazement it went on to win an Emmy as best um, international TV program in 1992 and that really that really was the point where it launched my career as a producer, launched Rafe's career. He went on to do immediately after that. He did Quiz Show and uh, Schindler's List. Uh, and it was a, uh, it was something that I felt, again, I'd, I'd learned a lot from in that process. And subsequently, the jobs that I did when I, when I was running full-time development or production in companies like Miramax and so on, I was always having to be involved and be very hands-on with what I was doing. It was but that inevitably, on almost everything that I did, I ended up having an executive producer role where I became involved as, for want of a better term, a, create, a creative producer. And that, I think, has just continued to evolve to this day, and that certainly is the way that I view myself. I feel that I'm very much somebody who likes to either find my own material and develop it or come on board something and work very closely with the writer and the director and so on. And I really enjoy the process of, of the creative side of it, you know, bringing on a really, really brilliant line producer to work with, a very good nuts and bolts person, that to have to be able to kind of view that and understand that, because obviously that's fundamental, and obviously it's fundamental in terms of setting up a film, think about the marketplace and where it's going to go to but the real joy always is working on the scripts and preparing a film and that actually you know on the set I like to be on the floor with the director and then I, I like to be involved when I'm allowed to be in the cutting room because I think that I have a pretty good eye for post-production work I, I think so I guess is... it's just sorry, sorry. Go on. no so I think it's just been an evolving process which came out of 
if you like, a very original impulse, which was as a journalist, I was writing about these things to something where that was always the creative input into it or impulse in it. And I think that's just developed further. And I've just learned more about the business and all and aspects of the business over, you know, 30 years or so. And I think that is something that seems to set you apart, looking back through your various work and your roles, actually. You know, when you're artistic director of Performing Arts, the screenwriting lab in the UK and Scrawl in South Africa, working with names like Simon Beaufoy went on to do Phil Monty, Lee Hall, you know, he went on to do Billy Elliot. You do seem to have a knack to find people just at the cusp of their career kind of break, you know, and then, you know, you facilitate that. And I guess my question really is about screenwriting, the quality of screenwriting, you know, how we can look at it, how we can improve it in the UK, because ultimately it has to all start with a fantastic script. It does. And I've been really fortunate that I was able to um, see these people's, you know, many people's work, at a very early stage, I remember, and sometimes it took longer than others for the for the world to catch up with that. I remember that that John Michael McDonough was one of the first writers I came across um, for the Performing Arts Lab in the nineties, and he'd written a western, which of course most um, <laughs> British writers, he's, I mean, I think John thinks of himself very much as an Irish writer, uh, would not necessarily have done that. Uh, but it was a brilliant piece of work, and I developed a feature script with him and various other people developed scripts with him, but it took about 20 years for him to really get going properly. It was only when he did The Guard that suddenly people went, oh, this guy is really talented as well. So anyway, it's been a privilege and, and, and really great to, to, to work with those people, and I still love it. I still absolutely love working with newer writers on finding something. For me, it's simply about recognising whether someone has a voice, um, and you can't, you can't, you can't, um, what's the word? It, it's something that's indefinable almost, except when you're that, that if you're reading it and you feel that there is something there that's resonating in an interesting kind of way with, with you, that I, I'm I'm quite willing to ignore the you know imperfection. That if something is kind of, I, of course, one wants to read scripts in the best way possible. But I'll always remember, I mean, the example I've used again and again on this, which was a kind of slightly different out, up, outcome to this whole thing. But when I was doing my screenwriting course in South Africa, uh, I read this really raw and completely messy piece about uh, gangsters in the 60s in Cape Town. And it was written by a very beautiful uh, man, uh, John, what's that? I can't remember his surname now, long time ago. Oh, so I'm sorry about these clicks. I hope that's not coming through and being too loud. But we can work with it, don't worry. <laughs> okay, I'm sure you can take it out. Anyway, John had, John was a, was what they disgustingly, because everyone was in a little box, uh, he was a cape-coloured, and he was a cape-coloured gangster. And he'd written this script, which was just so vivid and alive, and it was a total mess. Anyway, he came on the course, and he worked on it. Now, the script didn't get made, but he came back a year or so later, and he said, you know, uh, we were asking everyone what's happened and what's happened to your project and so on. And he said, well, I've got to tell you, this course changed my whole life because I now teach writing, creative writing in prisons to, no young, to young gangsters and young kids. And he said he just took everything he learned from the course and applied it to their work. I thought that was the most beautiful thing. And I thought that was a kind of a brilliant outcome of choosing someone, not because they know, you know, my friend Alan Plater always used to say, late Alan Plater, gorgeous man, always used to say, I can teach you know, how to write a screenplay in a morning. I can teach you a three-act structure. I can teach you, you know, where to put, put the breaks. I can teach you, you know, reversals. I can teach you this and that. What I can't teach you is have you got something to say? Have you got a voice that is unique or original or stands out in some way? And that's the bottom line for me is that I'm always hoping and looking for something that feels that it has flavour in, in a way, and that, that you know it can be it doesn't have to be outre, outlandish, or whatever. You take an example of something like Film Styles Don't Die in Liverpool. I knew Matt Greenhold would be the perfect person to adapt that story. He's a working class boy from Manchester, and I'd worked with him. He'd done uncredited work on a project that I'd worked on, and, I, and we'd never met before. But we just got on like a house on fire for the few weeks we worked together. And I sent him the book, um, which had been around for a long time. 
and just said, I think, I think you'll get this, which of course he did in seconds. And, uh, and he was, it was like casting. He was exactly the right voice and the right feeling and the right flavour for doing that. So that hasn't answered your question. Your question was, <laughs> what, what can we do to, to, in terms of improving things? Well, I think, the, I think let's, let's be honest, that the British television industry is going like gangbusters, that I think that, you, that we have an incredible amount of writers who have really distinctive voices and really do something remarkable. And that, and that could be anything from, you know, the, the, the people who write, you know, the Jack Thorns who write, you know, kind of incredible sort of drama in that way, to somebody like Jesse Armstrong, who I think has charted such an interesting path as a comedy writer with Peep Show and do it and working on the on the thick of it and so on. And suddenly he does Succession, which is like, uh, to me, it's like an, a, another level altogether. Mm. But it's drawing on all the things that he's he's developed in that time. So I think we have a pretty amazing group of screenwriters working in the UK. The, the challenge always is in feature films, whatever, and the, the challenge is what is a feature film these days, I would go on to say. But it, the challenge is always, what is it that might make something elevate in a way? I mean, this is what we all used to worry about, was what would make something elevate into being a theatrical event or something like that. Now, is that something that we're thinking about? Probably not in the same way, because something could be an event on Amazon or on Netflix. Yeah, and I think at the moment we're living in this extraordinary time uh, during the pandemic where you've got all these potential avenues for entertainment, you know, online, you've got digital, you've got so many routes now and just such a, a wealth of opportunity in the marketplace. And here we are in lockdown. Uh, how have you been spending it? Because I know you're not one to sit still. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I have to say, it sounds, it, it sounds awful to say it, but I've never been busier and I've never been able to work better because obviously I live in the centre of Soho. And uh, it's been, you know, quite extraordinary because it, it's like literally you wake up to hear the birds sing, you smell the grass being mown in the churchyard down down on Wardour Street, but it's like you're you are you're in a completely and utterly different headspace. And I think, like everybody, there was that kind of moment where you went, "This is so weird. I'm not quite sure." And you could have very hard to settle. I think every single person I spoke to said the first couple of weeks. Even though there was time infinite in front of us, that we were all sort of like getting up and down and making cups of tea and looking at something and not concentrating. Once that that level had passed, uh, it was such an amazing opportunity to be able to look at material for the future. And obviously, it's very frustrating. And I I, w I was five weeks into a film that I'm exec producing in in Canada. I wasn't there off of the shoot. But it's a Netflix film with Sandra Bullock, and that that was shut down five weeks in. We've got six weeks to shoot on that, um, and that was extremely frustrating, obviously. And I have a film that I'm planning to make this year about uh, the singer Marion Faithful, which is something that we were, you know, was still floating in the air as a possibility in September if we can move ahead at that time. If things, we'll see how things develop. So, so that frustrating. Sorry, I was just going to say to have things frozen in a halfway through is is everyone's worst nightmare on a production. Um, I'm just wondering that the insurance side of the business um, just has to support and sustain. I think I think there's a huge threat. It seems to me to to just productions in general that are homegrown. I'm just wondering how you. Uh, no, think. that's great. It's colossal. I think Andrew Eaton's piece in the Guardian yesterday was 100 percent correct. That, uh, that, you know, Netflix or Amazon or Disney can probably underwrite the threat. They can probably afford to get, find a way to go ahead and keep shooting. So Britain as a service industry uh, will, and like, uh, I imagine that the pound is going to continue to tank. I have, I have no confidence about the way things are going. With I think we were, we're heading for a no-deal Brexit. I think that we will be a cheap, <laughs> cheap, place to come and shoot something if you're a big American company and you want to come in and do that, which is fabulous news for uh, technicians and so on. And I think that's that's the greatest thing ever in the studio space and so on. They're going to have to figure out how to make all those spaces work and be safe and those things. But I think for smaller films, I think it, it's, it's a real problem unless we discover some way that 
for example, the government can underwrite the insurance costs because at the moment I'm hearing from my friends in uh, legal companies and so on. I mean, somebody said the worst case they, they've heard is that it could add 20% to the budget of a film if you could even get it. Because the big problem is that, you know, that, that someone said to me the other day, they've been offered insurance on a film, but it's uh, COVID excluded. It's like, well, that's, that's not exactly going to work, is it? So, <laughs> no, and that probably so I... casts into sharp relief, actually, the, um, the sides of your career. I mean, you've seen both sides of being freelance and, of course, working as part of a big company. I mean, can you just talk us through your roles on both sides of that fence and actually you know, what you think the advantages are on either side? Uh, <laughs> well, of course, it's very nice to be in a job and to have a paycheck and to feel that there's that, that you, and also to have the uh, resources that a major company has. And do it. I mean, I was lucky in that I've worked on with companies that in their heydays were producing, or with producers like David Putnam, that were producing fantastic, in my opinion, fantastic films and very fulfilling films. I've never been interested, I was never interested right from the start in being part of a factory line or just churning something out. I've always wanted to do things which have a distinctive flavour or whatever. And uh, that, that I've been very lucky to be involved in that. And of course, with David, he was working with high-end talent like Robert Bolt, who was like that one of the great experiences of my life to work with him. Um, and then at, at Miramax, which of course now we all feel is so tarnished by the horrors of, of what's been uncovered, but certainly in a working environment where <laughs> everyone in the company was you know, nose to the grindstone uh, seven days a week and 24 hours a day, that it was brutal in terms of the work that was going on. And there, and there was bullying and there was all the other stuff that we know about, <laughs> not, 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 not in front of our noses. But what was possible there was rather it was extraordinary because he, you know, we had money that was from Disney, but we had the ability to work. And I was lucky that I was put on the high end projects with Anthony Mingala and Martin Scorsese and so on. And so I was working with people that I could only dream about. I remember sitting in uh, Marty's cutting room on uh, Gangs of New York and I was sitting under a poster for Mean Streets. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I remember thinking I saw this film at the Academy yeah. in, when I was 13 years old. So it, 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 was, it was an incredible thing to do that. Of course, against that is the fact you are still part of apparatus in a way. And of course, the thing about being a freelance is that you are able to be a little more, it's, it's the boutique thing, isn't it? You can yeah. be much more homespun and you can be much more involved. I mean, it's just, it's just very exhausting. Because you're constantly figuring out, you know, what money you're going to make in a in a, p a given period of time, and when you're not likely to be making any money for a given period of time, and how to make that work. So it is a kind of a bit of a feast or famine existence, as every single person who's involved in it knows. Yeah, and, and effectively, you know, in any given moment in time, you're the CEO as well as you know the person making the tea, and you have to just deliver absolutely everything and get your shoulder to the plough. But what I love about you is you can hear unmistakably in your voice. Uh, a joie de vivre, a sense of a man who's <laughs> completely delighted with where he at is, where he's at in his life, and it's not I, often I you get to go on. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't, well, I, I can't believe I'm lucky enough to be doing it. I mean, it yeah. really is the thing that I am literally a kid from Croydon who woke up, you know, suddenly found himself in Martin Scorsese's cutting room. Yeah, you know, that's or epic. Ming, or, or Martin, or, you know, Anti Minghella was a really was a really close friend. That I miss every day. I, I have a thing I said to somebody that it's like um, Billy Wilder used to have a thing on his wall that would said, what would Lubitsch do when he was stuck? <laughs> yeah. And I have, I have metaphorically in my head something that says, what would Ant, Ant do if we, when, when I get stuck on certain things? Because he was such a brilliant, not only creatively, but he was a poet and a filmmaker and a brilliant uh, playwright and so on, but he was also a brilliant diplomat and politician and all those things. Incredible, incredible man. That was a, that's a huge loss, which I think, think we still feel, that you can't afford to lose people on that level. But I just am very lucky that I had the opportunity to do it. I've worked very hard to it. I mean, I was, like, I was obsessed with this. I didn't want to do anything else. I left school when I was young. I didn't go to university. I wanted to go straight into journalism. My plan was to become a film critic. And uh, so I was kind of driven by this thing. But 
no, I feel very fortunate. And I might say, by the way, on the freelance side of things, it's also that possibility that you have to do the really oddball things. Like one of the most enjoyable experiences I had in recent years was that Sky Arts uh, went to Jake Chapman, the artist, and said, have you got anything we could launch the revised Sky Arts channel with? And he and I had been tossing around the idea of making a film out of a book he'd written called The Marriage of Reason and Squalor, which I pitched to Sky as, well, here's the project. It's Jake and Dinos Chapman do Mills and Boone. And we saw on the basis <laughs> of that, they commissioned the scripts, which we got written in a month. A very good friend of mine, Brock Norman Brock, wrote them. I got Reese Ifans involved. We set the film up in, like, we shot in a studio in West London. It was all supposed to be on a Caribbean island. We were on air in um, in June, wow. and we were at the Edinburgh Film Festival in a, in a feature version in August. That's astonishing. And the whole thing was, yeah, it was it was like a fabulous ride. And if you see, the result is totally bonkers. I mean, I think it's very funny and very strange and very unique. Uh, and I'm very proud of it. And it cost like we made it for I think eight hundred thousand uh, pounds. So. Those things are fabulous alongside the, the huge, large-scale $60 million things. I think it's a, a fabulous thing to do that. And, of course, that there's also that thing that I, I do think is the case, which is infinite amounts of money don't necessarily make a better film. Yeah. That there is something about restrictions that really helps. Well, with that in mind, I have a question here from one of our members, Jane Lumino. She wants to know, as a producer, she says, I have several TV series in development. And I've got as far as I can, but now I need some development finance to engage a casting director, compile a schedule and a budget, and uh, produce a one-minute teaser. She says, uh, I realise Colin once ran the National Film Development Fund, but I wonder, do you have, Colin, any pointers in how to raise that all-essential development money now? I, you know what, I, it's the re I, I wish I had a really quick answer for this, because I have my own, uh, I have my own uh, company, for, and the... At this moment, I've just been re really kind of put it realigning things that I've been doing. I have done a lot of stuff for television, but now I'm really being clear about what I'm going to do in TV. And it needs you, you need uh, you do have to go out and, re and and put together a business plan and start raising money in that way. I mean, it's exactly the process that I'm in for Synchronistic Pictures, which is up till now has essentially been my my feature film company, but I'm now you know redirecting it towards TV as well and that's exactly the process I'm in there isn't really in 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 TV terms anything to do other than than pitching your project to you know going to the the usual suspects of the end users and so on to see whether people are interested but of course what you're Jane's talking about is doing something where she can prepare something earlier and that is really like my experience has been people have been looking for private finance or finding a friendly private financier and trying to work out some kind of way that that can be integrated into a business plan for the company. I haven't discovered, in film there was always this sense that in the old days, and I'm not even sure that's true now, because again in film, if you're looking for finance, you can go to the BFI, you can go to you know Channel 4, you go to the BBC, I mean those are the, and, and now of course you go to Sky or whatever, Netflix, whatever, but they're but to it develop independently, there were a small group of people you could always go to for feature films. For TV, it's always been, I think, a much trickier thing as an independent without having some kind of funding for your, for your company. So that's not a very helpful answer, but um, I, think it's, uh, I think it's the reality of the way things are. Yeah, I think the industry does seem to have moved that way where unless you, you have things in hand, it's extremely hard to, to get things away. So... Um, I also have a question here from Louis Sabu, who would like to ask you about film stars Don't Die in Liverpool. Uh, Louis mm. says, it's a beautiful movie with spectacular performances, and I believe that 30 years ago, Colin worked at Columbia Pictures, who then owned the rights of the book? Um, didn't Columbia own them? And then working title as well? It's, it's been through a few hands, hasn't it? It has. So basically, the book was published uh, in like 85 or 86, something like that. And... Uh, it was optioned by Linda Miles when she was working at Columbia Pictures in London. We were, we were there together, and she optioned it, and Putnam wanted to do it. Uh, and a script was actually written, uh, but 
everything sort of changed. That it was like when David was on was like only really David Putnam was only there at Columbia in a very brief period. So that version never went anywhere. Then the rights were picked up by Working Title, and that they developed several versions of it. And then after that, that didn't go any further. Um, Barbara Broccoli picked up the rights for Eon, and, and the irony of all of this is that Barbara knew. Gloria Graham and Peter Turner during this whole period, that she'd always been interested in it. But of course, at the time when it first came up, it was, wasn't something that she was, you know, in a position to do. Her dad was making the bonds, that that's what the company did. So she picked up the rights and she, and she held on to it and she was very close to Peter. So effectively, she just continued to renew the option year after year after year. And in 2010, which is when, this, this, when, it, when it first came up, Another another example of the lightning speed with which things happen. That in 2010, <laughs> I was leaving. Uh, I was coming back from London, having worked for, with Graham King in LA, and I was looking through projects that I'd always loved and had never happened. And I thought, whatever happened with film stars? And I found out from Peter's agent that um, Barbara still had an option. So I sent her a note and I just said. I've just worked with a great, with a really good writer, Matt Greenhold, on a project who I think is perfect. Do you want to have another go at this? And she said, and I'm a great believer, I call my company Synchronistic Pictures, I'm a great believer in synchronicity. She said, this is the weirdest thing. She said, two weeks ago, I bumped into Annette Benning at the BAFTA Awards, and she offered it to Annette, like, years before, and Annette had said, no, I don't want to do that, because she didn't feel she was the right age. And literally... The, de the week that I sent, or two weeks before I sent this note to Barbara, she'd seen Annette in the ladies' room at the BAFTAs, and Annette said, well, whatever happened to film stars don't die in Liverpool? So there you go. That, wow. was a, that was a sign that something was meant to happen. But I might say something was meant to happen, but it took six years before we shot it. We, 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 we had to go through a lot of stuff on that. Barbara was able to put up the money to develop the script with Matt. We did a deal where he got more money further down the line or whatever. Um, and then, but we, but the the two fundamental linchpins for getting that film made were Stuart Ford at, at his company. Then it was I M Global, and Stuart and I were meeting in Cannes about and talking about everything under the sun. And the last thing I'm thinking about is film stars don't die in Liverpool because he, you know, he's done Paranormal Activity and he's done huge Roland Emmerich films, all the rest of it. And we've gone through all the projects. And he says, oh, what else are you doing at the moment? I said, oh, I've got this fantastic project. And he kind of looks at me and goes, I'm from Liverpool. You know, I, yeah. I, I love this. I love this idea. Can you send it to me? And he read it overnight. And he never, from that point on, they were a fundamental component in the film. They, they, they and Lionsgate were the two people that were really fundamental in getting the film made. But it still took six years before we shot it. I think that right there is a, a great example of just being in the game, just stay in the game. You know, it's that sort of making your own luck effectively. You never know quite where the opportunity or the connection will come from, whether it's going to be in the ladies' room or just as a casual sort of comment at the end of a meeting. But those are the serendipitous moments that rely on a massive amount of work and dedication prior to that. Uh, I've got a question here, a two-parter actually, from oh. Stefan uh, Greif, who would like to ask another film stars don't die in Liverpool question. Uh, he says, uh, it, he, in, in his opinion, Annette Benning's work was on an equal footing with Anne Bancroft's in The Pumpkin Eater, for which uh, Anne, Anne was uh, richly rewarded mm. at the awards time. Do you have an opinion as to why uh, Annette Benning was, and I'm quoting, shamefully empty-handed and unrecognised? And, by the way, congratulations <laughs> to you on that beautiful, <laughs> underrated movie. Uh, and this his second part of his question is, is The Man Who Got oh, Carter available on DVD? Uh, second part of the question first. No, it isn't at the moment, and I hope it will be. It's a lovely little documentary. I, I, I mean, that's my friend Tony Klinger, who asked me to be involved with that because I loved his dad, Michael. He was one of the great Soho characters. This, this were, that anyone who knows me, I'm, I'm absolutely bald as a billiard ball. That this will date it. That I met Michael in the in a barber's shop. He was in one chair and I was in the other, and I was this kind of you know, pesky little journalist from Screen, and I'm sitting next to this guy, and I recognised him because growing up, I had been obsessed with um, Polanski and with Repulsion and Cul-de-Sac in particular, 
And I knew that Michael Klinger had produced those. And obviously he was quite, you know, it was a famous name and he produced Get Carter or whatever. And I'm sitting next to him in this barbershop chair and we just start chatting and uh, he was hilarious. He was one of the funniest men I've ever <laughs> met and brilliant at what he did. And like, oh my God, as a role model for a producer, like, you know, this is the guy who started in, you know, the clubs and things. He did, He basically was involved in, you know, kind of, they were making soft soft porn movies at the Compton Group or whatever, but he had incredible ambition to get out and get on. And Polanski comes in when you can't, they can't give him away in town after Knife in the Water. No one's interested. He's still an arty sort of thing. And, and Michael recognises this. And like, you know, if I'd produced Repulsion Cul-de-Sac and Get Carter, I would be very happy to retire from the business altogether <laughs> and feel that jo job done. <laughs> so no, it isn't yet, but I will find out from. T I'll get. A, I'll nudge Tony and see what's happening with that. Film stars. Yet, yeah, do I feel? Yes. Well, of course, I felt very sad about what happened. Apart from the fact that Annette is uh, an unbelievable actress, she's also one of the really, really, really most wonderful people I've ever met in my life. I mean, she's just everything you could imagine <laughs> of this beautiful, intelligent, thoughtful, fantastically talented actress. So I have no, I don't have enough words to talk about what I feel about her. I thought it was very sad and we did feel it was very sad what happened. I think two things happened. One is that our American distributors, um, I think I can speak fairly honestly about this, uh, our American distributors d didn't ha don't have a lot of money. Didn't have a lot of money, but they and they've always operated on a principle which I completely understand, which is if you throw enough of a substance against a wall, some of it will stick. Yeah. <laughs> That's really <laughs> how they would operate in terms of what they're going to get behind. And although we had an amazing launch at the Telluride Festival, which is a great honour to be invited to be one of the thirty films there. Uh, and an amazing uh, screening at the Toronto Film Festival, there was a little film that they were distributing called Call Me By Your Name, which just was like this Leviathan. It was like this, it was, it was just, it was unstoppable in terms of it hitting a kind of zeitgeist mood. And that year's mood was very much about lesbian and gay themes and very much about female empowerment. Now, I think Film Stars is a very strong film about female empowerment, but it wasn't Frances McDormand kneeing men in the nuts. It wasn't, mm. uh, it wasn't uh, I, Tonya, you know, kind of like wielding her kind of her hammer ar around or whatever. She, it was a different approach to, to female energy. And I think we got lost in the, the wave of what the film of what what films were hitting the zeitgeist so it's a fun, it's really extraordinary film I think it's probably the film of mine that has most it's got the longest shelf life of anything I've ever worked on already in terms of being discovered and rediscovered every time it turns up on Netflix or when it turns up on a plane or whatever I get a flood of emails rather sadly from people going, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I didn't see the film during the BAFTA season or whatever, or Academy season. I just love it so much and so on. And it, it was a shame. We, 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 I felt like we got swept under the carpet somewhat, particularly in America. I remember Barbara Broccoli and Paul McGuigan and I going over to do uh, a week of work in Los Angeles. And we met, you know, like a lovely people and wonderful actresses turned up to support us like Jane Fonda. But... <laughs> After every event, you just heard the sound of tumbleweeds blowing down <laughs> Sunset Boulevard. It was like a rather, rather depressing thing. Yeah, I guess the the awards ceremony. I mean, but thank you for the kind words about the film. Yes, I think I think I might have called him Stefan. I think it might be Stephen. I'm so sorry if I've got that wrong. I apologise. But yes, indeed, a great question. Oh, sorry. And, uh, thank you for that. Uh, so, uh, last question is from John Wollstonehome. Uh, Colin, which film or period in your long and distinguished career have you most enjoyed, and which have you enjoyed the least? <laughs> Hello, John. That's a very nice. That's a nice question. Um, gosh, well, yes, there's no question, and we're not going to dwell on it, that I made a film um, uh, which I kind of did, 
David Putnam said to me, the best advice he gave me, which of course I, I promptly ignored, was if you ever have a 1% <laughs> doubt about a project going into it, it will be a 100% doubt the day you're standing on the set. And there was one project I took on, it would really be invidious to say what it was, but there was one project I took on which uh, I should not have done. My, I had too many doubts, and I feel I didn't deliver for the, for the people involved on the film. I think my, my doubts you know, became, crept up too much, and I, I, I don't think any of us sort of emerged from it with much credit, and I really can't say what it is. But it was, it was, um, it's a film that some people quite like and that, that I'm quite always surprised when I occasionally, another one of the, my weird films that where people kind of sometimes send a note going, oh, I really enjoyed that or whatever. And I'm like, really? <laughs> I, I, have, I, 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 I call it, I've got about two or three of these, I call them my director shrink wrap collection because they're all sitting in on my shelf in DVDs, which I've never watched. And in the case of this particular film, I actually have never seen the finished film. I only ever saw sort of the dailies. I never saw it cut together. So that was a, that was not a good experience. But as I say, I take a lot of responsibility and you should not take something on that you're not committed to. And in terms of the, of the best experience, I think in the end, it was an, it was like a, an unbelievable battleground in every, every way. But Gangs of New York was an unbelievable experience. Yeah. I mean, it was like to arrive at Miramax and they've just bought the film from Disney. They've just taken it on from Disney. And like a, a, about a, two weeks later, I'm going up to sit with Marty and talk about the script and then working with Steve Zalian. And then I brought in Kenny Lonergan on the film and Hossein Amini and that, uh, that we're working, you know, everyone was working really closely. We built this incredible set at Chinachita. It was a quarter of a square mile on the back lot. There's hardly, there's only 12 CG shots in that film. Everything else is, is right? real. Uh, and it was just, and Sandy Powell doing the costumes and Dante Ferretti's design. It was in, incredible. It was an incredible experience. And the film did have problems of, at one point and it was very long and it didn't quite work. But I'm really proud of the film that we made. And of course, working with Scorsese was like, like you know, <laughs> <laughs> Marty would tell you the story as the same as I would. That we had our ups and downs and we had... Uh, we had some extraordinary moments, but we came out of it as really, I, 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 I can't say a really good friend, but someone that I admire beyond words and I still, and I love. And whenever we get together, they have to kind of put a, a thing between us because we start going into film, film nerd territory and enthusing <laughs> about this, that and the other. And people go, no, you're not here to do that. <laughs> so, yeah, so gangs without, I think without any question, was the was the next and also I, I as I say I'm really proud of the film now. Also, it's the most relevant film to watch right now. I would say to anybody if no if someone hadn't seen that film, this is a film about America now. This is a film that the party in it is the Know Nothings who were the really alt right version of the Republicans that Bill the Butcher is kind of like a, a, a leading figure in and they are nativists and they believed that that they had to stop the immigration of the Irish because it was destroying the white the Anglo-Saxon Protestant base of America and they hated the African Americans but they hated the Irish even more and there was this constant opinion that the and the underclass were being recruited to go and fight in the civil war they were in fact they were made to it that they were enlisted but if you were rich you could buy your way out so suddenly you had this divide between uh, the rich and the poor, and it culminates in the draft riots, which I didn't know about, and I think a lot of people didn't know about, where basically they lost control of New York City. These these draft riots where people were protesting, it broke out, and they sent in the army that were coming back from like Antietam or something, one of the big Civil War battles, and they didn't know which side the army was going to go on, whether they would throw their lot in with the loot with the with the rioters, or they would be part of the government. I turn on my television and I'm watching Gangs of New York in, in 2020. I mean, it's like it's so relevant about, about the, the, the way America is. And one of the most saddest things is, and this was a brilliant marketing line by one of the very clever people at Miramax in the marketing department, that the, the slogan for the film was America was born on the streets. And I really think that that's, um, we're seeing that up, uptick of, incredible violence and and this this primal sort of 
thing and this this battle that's in get the, the, the that's going on for kind of America's soul in a way. All of that is part of the film. So I'm very proud that we did something which actually has something to say about that and holds a mirror up to that world. It certainly does. And it's extraordinary times, as you say, that we live in with just, I'm aghast at the uh, level of strife and conflict with the backdrop, of course, of the pandemic. Stories will emerge from it, no doubt. But um, no, I shall rewatch Gangs of New York. It's a brilliant movie. And Bill the Butcher still haunts my dreams. One of the most terrifying characters, I think, uh, in cinema history, it's um, yeah something else that. Uh, so thank you for that, Colin. Final question from me: uh, Is there a project that has got away from you? Is there one out there that you really wish you'd managed to uh, to bring home? <laughs> uh, well, well, we'll, we'll see whether it happens or not. I have one project which I, well, in fact, I've got two projects which I, which I, which I, which I do really love and which I haven't been able to. Well, one of them is now in the works. So one of them is a uh, is a uh, the extraordinary story of Ord Wingate, not when he was in Burma, but in the period when he's in Palestine, and that's a really I think extraordinary story that again speaks volumes about the world that we live in and what's going on, but very controversial, very difficult to to achieve in a lot of ways. But that's something I still think that there is an important film. To be made about him and the people around him and some of the really you know extraordinary uh, Israeli and Palestinian well it's Palestinians that were there at the time that were dealing with with you know kind of this very volatile period um, the other one that I that is <laughs> not proven as yet but is something I've wanted to do for because I do have a tendency to hang on to things for a very long time so <laughs> I have a project <laughs> that I've been involved on for oh gosh i've been on this for uh 20 years now maybe 10, it must be something like gosh when would it be maybe maybe 15 years something like that my co-producer on it has been on it for about 25 years it's uh, an incredible story about which is very uh, and i think is something people really want to see and will want to see it's about this show that ran in palm springs for 23 years called the fabulous palm springs follies where uh, a true story of this guy that retired went to palm springs and they said to him you know kind of well, you've worked in show business or whatever. we've got this old theater that jack benny used and he said do you think have you got any ideas for it and he said well i have actually and he put on this show that was this massive success for 23 years, we're basically retired showboys and girls in their, generally in their 70s, sometimes up to their late 80s, would put on a show and there would be old um, dance, there would be dance numbers and there would be ventriloquists and you occasionally get like Donald O'Connor or something like that to come out. But it's it really was, it was a show that you went in and you kind of went in somewhat, I went in somewhat cynically, my friend had been on about it for so long. Uh, and you came out in floods of tears. It was so moving, this kind of real do not go gentle into that good night kind of attitude of these incredible old troopers or whatever. So that is is being, that is, we that we finally, after years and years and years of, of not getting it anywhere, but my friend, by the way, to start, I started on this at Paramount when Sherry Lansing was there with Colin Welland, who was a great friend of both of ours, writing a treatment. Well, Sherry Lansing left and that was the end of that. And for years, no one was interested in it. People kept saying no one's interested in films about old people. And then Marigold Hotel came along and now everyone goes, well, it'd be great to do something about old people. <laughs> uh, and this is just a beautiful, beautiful story. And Lionsgate now are behind it in America. And we have an incredible writer, and I can't say who it is, but she is just so perfect for it. Um, and we're just hoping that this has been sitting with her for a while while she's cogitated and she's supposedly working. So pray for me that this gets done because it's the most beautiful, uplifting, funny, moving, touching story. It's the kind of film that I, I, I would happily pay my $20 to go <laughs> at the box office now in advance to go and see because it's going to be really, really fantastic. Well, it sounds just the tonic for the times that we're living in, and we wish you well with it, Colin. Um, thank you so much for joining us here on the Media Lunch Club podcast, and we hope to see you very soon at one of the lunches. Thank you very much, and uh, and good luck to everyone with their projects. I know it is the weirdest time 
to be in. But uh, I think it's kind of like if we can recalibrate a little bit and come back more thoughtful and kind of uh, and stronger, then that's going to be a great thing, right? Absolutely right. Thanks, Colin.